Welcome to The Breakdown with Brad Corp and Becky, a weekly podcast that breaks down politics, policy, and current affairs. I'm Becky Sher. And I'm Michael Broadcorp. For the first time in a while, today's show is going to be just the two of us. We're going to focus on a variety of topics from the past week, starting with the infamous second annual Easter turkey versus ham debate. We'll then break down the controversy surrounding President Biden's tweet on Easter celebrating International Transgender Day of Visibility. We will stay on the topic of national politics by breaking down NBC's recent hiring and firing of former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel. Then we'll hit on the abortion topic by discussing a recent Axios poll on the issue and what voters really think. And we'll end with a brief breakdown of last week's State of the State address from Governor Tim Walz. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy the show. Well, Becky, we're back. For another episode. Did you have a nice Easter weekend? Did have a nice one. We went to Joe's family's place in Marshfield, Wisconsin, and it was a lovely drive. It was our first drive on the way there without factoring a nap or sleep time for the baby. And well, he's not a baby, he's almost two. But yeah, it was great. We had Easter egg hunts, we had some family come over, and it was fantastic. That's so- wonderful. I was down in the state of Iowa for part of the for part of the Easter weekend and just a lovely time. Great drive down there. Got to see in-laws, family. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my sister-in-law, Alori, who uh, is listening to the podcast on a regular basis and was disappointed that she had not been mentioned yet. And so I just want to give a shout out to her for listening and uh, note that, but I had a great time in, in Iowa and came back and pen, spent part of the day, part of Easter in Minnesota, too, with my family, my mother. It was great to see her. It was great to see talk about stuff. I did spend some time, and I think it's a good segue into our first subject, which is, once again, our long battle, ham versus turkey. Um, Have you learned the errors of your ways? Well, no, but I do have a caveat here. Oh, interesting. I wore you down after a year. Go ahead. Yes. So we had a delicious ham, had a great glaze on it. It was fantastic. However, the in-laws were here in town about a month ago and we asked them, hey, I got this friend who sent me a turkey. Would we like to include this in our Easter dinner? The Cher extended family Eight turkey provided by the one and only Michael Broadcorb and your wife that you sent us for Chris or for part of our wedding gift. And I have to say it was delicious. My father-in-law injected it, got all the good stuff under the skin and deep fried it. And it was tasty, man. It's a, it's an Easter miracle. It's not the, it's not the Easter miracle, but it's, it's an Easter miracle. That's fantastic. So you had turkey on Easter yes. supplied. So- Ham used the gift I had. That's fantastic. Well, it was good. It was not dry. It was great. It was tasty. A big hit. So while I still believe that ham is the meat of the day, well, that's a weird thing to say. Yeah. The, the turkey was delicious. And uh, yes, so thank you. My family is grateful. It was delicious. And so we had a good little chat about you on Easter. That's what which everyone wants to do is talk about um, me on Easter. That, that's obviously great. Uh, I just have to say to you, so I had, I think I've become more, much more militant in my anti, I think you, I think our debate about ham versus turkey has made me much more militant about my anti ham agenda. And so I was, you know, asking some questions. Now, let me also bring up something that I think is, I had not exposed on, which is leftovers. I'm a a big, I'm a big Thanksgiving leftover person. And I I really put some more thought into this and I'm not going to deviate from my position on ham, but I am going to couch it a little bit differently, which might help explain my reasoning and might explain it a bit more than just an anti-ham agenda. Ham, I've come to real, I've come to realize, and I learned this from speaking with my mother about it. I'm a very bland eater, apparently. I'm not into seasoning, spices, and so we both came to the realization that she doesn't like ham because it's really salty. And it's really, see, and it's, you get the glaze on it. You get all that stuff. It's really over flavored in my take. It's just very salty. And so it, I think that the reason why I gravitate more towards ham, it's just more vanilla. It's just more bland. And so you can add stuff to it. And I think, and I discussed this with my mom, we discussed if ham, which I don't think you can do. I don't think you can, the whole process of curing a ham and salting it up and doing this stuff. So 
I guess if there was a less salty version of ham, I would be more inclined. I also, the consistency of it bothers me. Like I see people eating ham steaks and stuff. It's just ridiculous. But I, it was an interesting discussion on ham. I also live with the leftovers. After we, we had Easter dinner down in Iowa on Sunday evening. I'm sorry, on Saturday evening. So it was the night before because we were going to be leaving the next day come to come back to Minnesota. So we you know went to church and then left. The leftover situation with Easter is also bad because late in the evening then, I'm like, I'm hungry. I want to have some leftovers. You have all these great sides, but then you got to supply the ham. And it's just, I like the turkey sandwiches versus the ham, mm. but I thought I would explain it in that way because I'm known, those who have been around me that have seen me eat know that I'm a very bland eater. I'm not into like salt or anything. I'm just a bland eater. I sometimes think I like mild salsa. I'm just not a spice kind of person. So that might be a little bit why I, I have such strong objections to ham. So this is a Michael problem, not a ham. First of all, let's just be clear. Everything's always a Michael problem. <laughs> it's, not, that's ne it's never the innocent ham's fault. But I will say to you that I realized, particularly in when it came to de dealing with the leftovers, that that's really the ham uh, and the salt. And speaking with my mom, I figured it out a little bit more. And so... I think it's great. I think we both learned a little bit this Easter Absolutely. about stuff. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear deep frying a turkey is something I've always wanted to do. I'm so impressed by people who do it. It's a great way to do it. Uh, I understand. I've seen it done. I've eaten it. I haven't done it myself, but it looks like the person who dealt with that ham and, and did it was an aficionado, was a connoisseur of ham. I'm sorry, of turkey and delivered a good quality poultry product on Easter, which is just so remarkable to, to know. It was delicious. Yes. A happy day. The worst part about the day is that pretty quickly after our Easter supper or dinner, we had to jump in the car so Wyatt could catch his nap on the way home. And that's a heavy meal to have right before sitting in the car for three and a half hours. But we survived. Yeah, you can't drive after eating a, a good Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is like a day passenger, visit. Thankfully. Oh, you're the pa that's fantastic. You got to be the passenger. Wonderful. I'm glad you had a lovely Easter with your family got back safe. I'm glad there was some jerky involved. And again, in the interest of transparency, I did have a little ham. I have my crit criticisms of it. I'm not going to be rude, but I did have ham and it has its role, just not as the main act. But thank you for discussing that. And thank you for keeping this rivalry going. Always. Continuing on the trend of Easter here, there was a little dust up over the weekend, some backlash against a tweet that President Biden sent out on Easter Sunday. While he did send out, he is, I believe, Catholic. He's Christian. Yes, he's Catholic. Um, just tweeted, Jill and I send our warmest wishes to Christians around the world, celebrating the power of hope and the promise of Christ's resurrection this Easter Sunday. He also tweeted, Today on Transgender Day of Visibility, I have a simple message to all trans Americans. I see you. You are made in the image of God and you are worthy of respect and dignity. Now, International Transgender Day of Visibility was established 15 years ago, has always been celebrated on March 31st. This is the second time in those 15 years that it happens to also fall on Easter because Easter is a moving target. And so there was some backlash, both against Biden and his Christianity, but also just some folks who thought it was inappropriate for this to also be celebrated on Easter Sunday. What's your take on this? I think it is one of the most disingenuous, idiotic, moronic debates I've ever seen on social media. It was just moronic. First of all, Joe Biden did not in any way. First of all, Joe Biden is Catholic. He in no way, shape, or form attempted to erase Easter. He was recognizing another aspect of that day that he chose to acknowledge. He's done these types of proclamations in the past. Nearly every day, there is, depending on any day of the year, there's some random proclamations that are done. And, and I don't want to be dismissive of any of them by saying they're right, but I'm just saying on any given day, the president is issuing proclamations recognizing what this day is. And so I, I understand the politics of it. I just, I, I don't respect the argument, which is that someone chose to weaponize for the sake of riling up their base, a little bit of hatred on Easter Sunday or the day before Easter, trying to masquerade and pretend as if Joe Biden was erasing Easter. It's simply a dishonest argument. The other point that I think folks were trying to make was that Joe Biden had removed or banished from the Easter egg hunt any symbols, any religious symbols 
on that day. Actually, that's been a practice that's been going on from my understanding around 45 years. So it was the double whammy of here, Joe Biden is trying to erase Easter. He's then also banning any kind of religious imagery from the White House Easter egg kind of hunt and roll that they do, which isn't the case. It's was done, it was the same practice that existed under Donald Trump exists under Joe Biden today. There's been no change in the policy that I'm aware of. I think that this is just incredibly disingenuous, a disingenuous arguments. And my best example of that is Caitlyn Jenner, who had tweeted out previously acknowledging acknowledging transgender day of visibility on previous years, but then wanting to buy into this false narrative of that this year is because it was falling on Easter, it was a problem. And it's just an inconsistent, it's, first of all, it's not a valid argument. It's based on misinformation. Um, I think it's going to be a good segue into our next conversation, but I was just disappointed to see people wanting to engage in that type of misinformation and get into religion and use it in that type of way, I just think was really inappropriate. Your take. I agree. I think it's a mountain out of a molehill here. Every day since he has been president, he has tweeted both Happy Easter and a celebration of uh, International Transgender Day of Visibility. This is not something new. This is not something that he did just because they fell on the same day. Two things can be true at the same time. We can celebrate multiple things. And like you mentioned, this is something I do for my jobs now and in the past is very often look up days of note. There is a day every day, right? But every day is a day of donuts or coffee or agriculture or administrators. There's a day to celebrate everything. This just happened to be a day that folks tried to make politically charged when there wasn't that behind it. Now, I understand that there are, obviously, this is Easter is a huge day for Christians. And I understand there's a lot of Christians that do have issues with sexual identity or transgender individuals. And, and I understand that dynamics. But that was not what this is. You can just, can you just ignore the president's tweet if you don't, if you don't buy into that, or if you don't support that? It was ridiculous. Uh, Speaker Johnson did uh, also question whether he knew whether Biden knew what he was signing, which, again, I get the whole principle here of the dings on Biden's mental capacity. But like I said, this is something that he has celebrated for the last three years. While he has been in office, this has been something that has been celebrated by the White House and folks for the last 15 years since it has been proclaimed or uh, announced or set on this date. And it has always been April, March 31st. So it, it should be a done deal. And it was just ridiculous. I will also say, as someone who is, let me just also, I, I think I mentioned this to you before, that my general take on religion is I want to know it's a part of your life. It, I view religion, religion a lot like exercise. I'd like to know it's a part of your life, but I don't want to see you do it. That's always been my take on religion, is that I'm not one to talk uh, about my faith. I don't, I don't ask friends what their religious mean. You and I have discussed it just in the context of the show sometimes occasionally, but I don't, it's not one of my questions that I want to know. As a practicing Roman Catholic, someone who attended mass on Sunday, having a day for transgender day of visibility does nothing to distract from anything that I experienced on Easter. And in fact, I just think it's so objectionable that this kind of narrative was framed out as I to, to sit in church or to sit anywhere and on, on all days to act as if transgender people do not exist. And we're going to want to stake that flag that one day, it is, it's just simply ridiculous. And I'm, it, it offends me on multiple levels, but I, I get frustrated when people bring up, when they introduce religion into the political sphere to the level which they do. This was done to, once again, target a group of individuals who are just looking in many ways, to just be seen and respected for who they are. And people want, to, there's a group of people who want to, at any given point, try to say that recognizing that those people exist somehow, some way diminishes what they're experiencing or what they see. I have to tell you something. I went to Easter Mass at a Catholic church. I don't know if someone at that Mass or someone that I went or I was in contact with that day was transgender, but I certainly don't believe that acknowledging that transgender people exist ex had, uh, takes away from anything that would occurred on Easter Sunday, either at church or any part of the day. 
And the fact that there are people out there that want to weaponize that type of stuff for political example, for political reasons, I just think is so unfortunate. Goes into my whole rant. I could go on at some point. My frustration with Republicans, where we believe that government should not control all aspects of our lives, but then get frustrated and want them to insert themselves in different ways. So, correct. Yeah, frustrating. Not surprising, but frustrating. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for discussing it with us. Yes. With me. I am excited for our next topic because I believe we might have a little bit of a differing of opinions on this one. We are going to break down the hiring and firing of former RNC chair Ronna McDaniel. So just a little bit of background for folks who might not be aware. Ronna was previously chair of the Michigan GOP. She was picked by Trump to take over the RNC. She was served as chair there from 2017 to 2024. Recently stepped away because President Trump, I think there was a mutual agreement that she is no longer the flagship, the best person to that with Trump as the nominee to to run the national party should be mentioned. She was the longest RNC chair serving since the Civil War, which is so a couple weeks after she stepped down as the chair of the RNC, she was hired as contributor for NBC and fired within four days. So I guess let's start with before we oh, go ahead. No, you I want what's going to have you start. Okay. So starting just initially, before we even get into the controversy and her getting fired, initial takes of her being hired on my side, I do really like Rana. I think that she has done a good job. She's been a strong vocal Republican woman over the years. <clears throat> then I think that she has done, showed good leader, leadership and has been a good party messenger. That said, I think there is something that we need to look at when you're a party messenger or campaign messenger of what your job is and what that entails. So I thought it was a great, a great hire. Personally, I think that obviously I, I think that our major news channels need to do more to bring in the Republican side. They, there's been a lot of conflict under the Trump era with news media in general and what they say about Republicans and and obviously namely Trump. So the, the the Trump angle is all over this. And then she was hired four days or fired four days later. And to me, that was something that I was like just blown away with. First, it's a, a total PR disaster. And we'll chat about how it even got to that point of hire and fire. But to me, it was something I took it as I had a different take than I think you did. And obviously, I've read a little bit more and thought a little bit more about it. So I see your side of things. But from my point of view, it was once again, a double, oh, what is the word I'm looking for? The way we're double, double standard, standard, right? So we have Jen Pisaki or however you say her last Jen name. Zaki. Josh Ernst, we've had Jay Carney, we've had all of these different Democrats coming from, from really high powered um, positions, getting hired within days or weeks of their leaving the White House or wherever they were to no fanfare. And then from my perspective, this was Rana, the leader of the Republican Na National Committee who was hired and Democrats had a lot of issue with it and pushed her out because we don't want Republicans and Republican voices to have that strong of a point of view on our news stations. Now, I saw some tweets from you about this and you took the angle that a lot of folks and, and what I'm reading about uh, that there are a lot of folks. And so I want you to get into your view because yours really centers more about the election denier and January 6th, I believe, correct? Yeah. I mean, so, let's say a couple of things. First and foremost, I think that, I think that the media, there are clear examples, clear, unrefutable, I think, examples where the media has bias. I've long said that. I've long said that there is a media bias that exists, number one. Number two, I do believe that television stations, networks, media outlets need to do more to include conservative voices in their coverage. I do not believe, on the whole, that coverage is balanced uh, along party lines. I think that there is pretty clear evidence and just anecdotal experiences and other things that, that I've had where I could make that case very easily. That being said, and one more point I'll make, which is that there's been a clear kind of conveyor belt that has existed between people working in politics and then becoming analysts, pundits, and having more established roles inside media. The problem here is not, so all those things are true, I believe. The problem here, though, is I think is Ronna McDaniel, is that I would say that her appearance on Meet the Press and how she transitioned made was, I think, was just disastrous. I think her literally going from literally flipping a switch and just saying, well, I'm not the, I'm now not the RNC, I'm not the RNC chair anymore. 
but I don't have to say those things way too quick, way too fast, not enough thought and analysis. And the transition that a lot of media personnel have taken from their previous role. So if they worked in politics and then became on-air analysts, Ronna McDaniel, I think is just a bit different. I think just a bit different because of what she's trafficked in and what she's done. First and foremost, I will say, I think that there needs to be a perspective. There needs to be attention given to having there be a voice for people and having discussions on what the candidacy of Donald Trump and their supporters believe it. Uh, let me just also explain a little bit. I get called very often by media outlets to comment on partisan politics from the side of the Republicans. I always disclose at the beginning of those requests, if they're asking about the presidential race or they're asking about Donald Trump, I say I didn't support him in 16 or 20. I will not be voting for him again in 24. So if you're looking for someone to offer a pure Trump perspective, you should probably go somewhere else. Now, that being said, I think uh, my analysis of Trump has been fair. I certainly do not like him as a person and as a candidate and what I can certainly push back on that, but we have had people on our podcast that are 100% Trump supporters, and we can have those types of discussions. We can have a discussion on that race. What I think is so problem about Ronna McDaniel is what she has espoused, what she has pushed, and where she is coming from. Her role at the RNC, all of the facts you laid out about her tenure and all that things are great. The truth of the matter is that she has been she was at the leadership of a political party at a time when the Republican president was doing a number of things, I think, to undermine uh, democracy, to undermine journalism. And Rana was there right by his side doing those types of things. And so I think the transition was a bit too quick. I think there can be a space for Rana McDaniel in the media. But I honestly believe the reason why um, I didn't really, I don't think I jumped on, um, not I'll fact check myself, but I don't believe I made any comments when she was hired, but I was supportive of the decision to let her go because I think her one and only appearance on Meet the Press, I thought was disastrous. I don't think that she had put any constructive thought into how she was going to answer in a compelling, candid, and I think insightful way, how she was transitioning so quickly. And I think that's ultimately, I take the reason why I think it was good for that. It was a mistake for them to hire her. And I supported their decision to have her leave was in large part because of her appearance on Meet the Press. So a few things about that to clarify. So they announced that they hired her. She had been previously booked in this spot on Meet the Correct. Press. Correct. So Kristen Walker did have some frustrations with that because it was meant to be a rather hard hitting interview and started out by saying she was an just hire. This is not something I had to do with. I'm still going to do my interview. But she's technically a colleague with this woman now, right? This is no longer now an objective sitting on the same side of they're both NBC employees. Yes, um, but one of them is different than the other. 100%. 100%. But it changes the dynamic. Some could perceive that it would change the dynamics of how you interview somebody that you may have been a little harsher on previously. I don't think it did. I think Kristen Walker did a great job. But playing devil's advocate a little bit here, do you not think that NBC is a little bit at fault for not preparing Rana for those questions? They knew those questions were going to be coming that they did not, similar to like our conversation when we chatted with Erin Dupree and felt that the walls in the administration left her out in the wind and not able to answer and, and deal with some of this. Wasn't NBC, this is now their little new little figurehead. Don't you think that they should have had some media prep or some conversations with her heading into that? Based on what I've read, there was not a mu there was not much prep that was done. And so I think NBC was also short sighted in this. I, I don't think I don't think Rana McDaniel is at fault for accepting the job. I think the the problem was the hiring and the letting go of her. I think the problem was that NBC had hired her in the first place. And so, yes, you are correct. But to be fair and answer the question fully, I think NBC made a mistake in hiring her. And I also think the process that was done to prepare her for those appearances, the her one appearance was not good. But I also don't think Ronna McDaniel is without blame in the situation. Oh, God, and, yeah. I, and so I think the problem that the mistake I think NBC made was hiring Ron and McDaniel. Then they made process mistakes 
behind the scenes in how they handled it internally and other mistakes. But I just think Ron and McDaniel was the wrong hire. Again, I'm not to say that you can't have that. I think there absolutely needs to be a perspective on Trump. I think news coverage needs to be as balanced as it can be. But let me also a caveat to something. It is not the responsibility of journalists and the media to just act as to just act as uh, you know, court reporters and report exactly what reporters exactly what people are saying. There is a, a number of things that Ronna McDaniel did in her capacity as chair of the RNC to undermine that some of the basic tenets of our country, elections and democracy. There's a number of things and narratives that she pushed in the media that were completely fictitious. And so if she now wants to be seen as someone who is credible, she just can't show up to NBC, slap their logo on, uh, slap a peacock on her chest or an, a lapel pin, and suddenly told the party line and think that transition is going to be that easy. I think what's missing here in a number of people is they, Jen Psy, and, and I'll just say this to you again, what do I believe? I believe that there is a, there, that there is a bias in the media. I believe that that media markets, media outlets, newspapers need to do a better job of ensuring that their coverage is balanced, fair and balanced, and that it has and invites conservative perspectives, in, including those of Trump supporters. They have every responsibility to do that. I just think in this particular instance, bringing in someone who is as intimately involved comes with some barnacle. It comes with some problems that need comes with some additional wrinkles that I don't think anyone is stopping and realizing that's what's going on. Now, there's a big difference in my mind between Jen Psaki and Ronna McDaniel, and it has nothing to do with partisanship. It has to do with, did Jen Psaki engage in the same level of misinformation? Did she challenge our democracy in a way? Did she, did she, did she engage in that type of activity? She didn't. That totally changes the dynamic. And so for, for people to go out there and say that she should be treated like Jen Psaki or Chuck Todd or other people who have worked or Tim Russer, a number of people who work for Democratic elected officials, I don't think is once again a good example. It's a fundamental understanding of what Rhonda McDaniel engaged in and what she did during her time as RNC chair. And to think that she's in the same position as Jen Psaki, I think is incredibly oversimplistic. As I was reading it and here listening to you now, I, I do understand the extra dynamic that it really does come because obviously you and I have made it very clear that January 6th was an insurrection and that we believe that Joe Biden legitimately won the 2020 election. So those are two things that that you and I have in common that we've talked about. And I think where, and this is maybe just more of a personal viewpoint for me, is that I spent a number of years working for individuals or party or, or the MNGOP, both as communications director and as executive director, where a lot of my role was supporting President Donald Trump writing things for my members, writing statements, tweeting both from myself and the party and posting on social media, how great Trump is, all of this. Now, I did leave the party and my partisan politics roles in October of 2020. And I was not there in the 2020 election, nor on January 6th. But for me, I do understand really what our, or what Rana has been saying about that was my job. My job was to say these things, do these things. As the RNC chair, as the person who is the top of the party that our presidential, presidential candidate and nominee represents, that is my job. And, and that's something that was hard for me to grapple with. And, and I've had, I have had some guilt about that. But that is where <clears throat> I think I, I totally understand where she's coming from, that what her level of a belief on that spectrum of what she was saying and what she actually believes, I do believe uh, could differ. Um, I, I think Really, what it comes down to for me is, like you said, I, I when we did see her on that Meet the Press interview, she was not adequately ready, prepared to talk about that. And she did seem like it was just flip-flopping. She pushed, made the call to the Michigan County election folks and waffled on that. She did say that Biden legitimately won the election, but was pushed why it took her until now to talk about that and didn't have those appropriate questions other than it was my job. But I think that's where I just have a little 
maybe personal bone to pick or just personal issue with this is because I feel also sometimes should I be held to the standard of what I was pushing and what I was saying. Now, again, it wasn't about election denying. It wasn't about January 6th. And I'm hoping that's where that division is. But I, I'm, I'm interested as you were a party official, you worked in these jobs working for members, which I have to assume you didn't believe fully everything that all of the members you you work for everything that they stood for. But I'm curious if you do understand, do get what where she is saying where that was her job. I absolutely do. I absolutely get how she thinks it. And I think how she thinks it is that the what she was doing in that partisan role was just following the directive and taking one for, as she described it, taking one for the team. I think she's misreading the level which she was involved. And I don't think that she's is introspective enough at what she participated. Former Congressman Liz Cheney said, Rana facilitated Trump's corrupt fake elector plot in his effort to pursue Michigan officials not to certify the legitimate election outcome. She spread his lies and called January 6th legitimate political discourse. That's, quote, not taking one for the team. It's enabling criminality and depravity. I, I think the former congresswoman is spot on. That's the distinction here. And I think that and, and that's the distinction that I think people just don't want to make. I, again, and I'm being this specific because I want to push back a little bit on some of the response I got on social media from some people. Uh, I believe the media is biased. I believe they need to do a better job of including conservative voices, including those who passionately believe in the candidacy of Donald Trump. I do believe they knew, need to do a better job of that. I recognize on the surface some of the comparisons that are that folks are trying to make. But in, in but I believe it was her meet the press appearance that really sunk it for her. I don't think that she had adequately put any thought into how she was going to have to explain and justify positions that are out of step with the vast majority of Americans. Let, let me go a bit further here. Becky, if you believed that January 6th was legitimate political discourse, if you believed that Joe Biden didn't win the election, I would not host a podcast with you. No, that's fair. And I would hope that if I believed in those things, you would have questions too. But there are certain just basic things that I, I wouldn't do. I would not host a podcast with someone who held those types of those views, because here's the reason why. I am sure that we have had people on our podcast who have questions about the 2020 election. We will at some point have conversations with people about the 2020 election, even, and we will approach it from the standpoint from the position that I think both of you and I, what both you and I believe in, as you articulate, is that the 2020 election was legitimate and Joe Biden is the legitimate president of the United States. Those are, and so I completely understand that there are people out there that don't believe that, but I would not want to lend my brand and would want to have a podcast with someone or have someone on consistently on that subject and not push back. And I think that. The, what Rana McDaniel engaged in, particularly as was articulated by former Congresswoman Chain and other things, is why this transition is so problematic. I do not believe, I do not believe, I don't have any responsibility to repeat the false narratives that other people espouse. And, and I talked, and I, when I wrote the book I wrote about the disappearance of some missing kids, I part of the title is about the, the adults who conspired to keep the truth hidden. There, there were a number of people in that were involved in that case that trafficked in lies and misinformation. Um, not surprisingly, many of them were Trump supporters, but they trafficked in lies and misinformation. There are people that in, in the course of writing that book that believed one plus one did not equal two in some instances. And so you get to a point where what would I gain? What do I gain if we want to have, number one, productive conversations, thoughtful conversations, and we want to banter back and forth? How can we do that? How can there be a discussion when one of us, either me or you, doesn't believe the 2020 election was in, was valid, that Joe Biden wasn't the legitimate, legitimately elected president? If I believe that or you didn't believe that, I don't think this podcast dynamic would work. There has to be, I think, some general concepts that we believe in order to have this type of discussion. Um, and that's what I think makes work. That being said, you and I have never said we're not going to have Trump people on, or we, we don't have a prerequisite. I think our only kind of general rule about who we want to have on is people that we think could be 
a part of substantive, thoughtful conversations, and for lack of a better word, aren't going to be jerks. Is that probably it? But we've, but I wouldn't say to you, and I don't think you've said to me, Michael, we can't have someone on who doesn't, who we can't have a Trump supporter on. We can't have someone on who doesn't believe that the 2020 election, we've never said that, I don't think, to each other, nor would that be a prerequisite, correct? Absolutely. We've already had Trump supporters on. We might not have talked about Trump, but we've certainly had lots of them on. So my point is not, and, and I think some people, I think, are mistakenly wanting to die on a hill here. That's honestly not worth dying on, I think, because I think the issue here is Ron and McDaniel. And I think th that's my issue with it. It's the meet the press appearance coupled with what she said. She was just in an unattainable position. And I think you've explained it. I think you, you added the dynamic of NBC, which I think is important. I think it's a good comparison on kind of the Andrew Priest situation about not, not having, their not, having the institution that hired, in that instance, it was the Walls administration, not did enough to vet her and I think also prepare her. I don't think Ron and McDaniel was prepared for what she was going to walk into on NBC. And I absolutely think that Ron and McDaniel can serve as an analyst on a television station. There's no question she can. But I do believe that she needs to explain, other than just a glib answer on her first appearance, not in, in her first appearance on the network after her hiring had been announced, that, but it had been pre-scheduled. I think she needs to offer a more detailed answer as to why her positions have changed, other than this is now who's signing my check, basically. I do, <clears throat> excuse me. I do want to chat just a, a couple things before we jump off this topic. Going back to that Meet the Press interview, it is mind-boggling to me that she was so unprepared, even aside from this announcement. So let's just say this announcement did not happen. She is just going on as the recently stepped down RNC chair. In that media prep, which she has a team, they let her go after this. Her agents dropped her after this NBC debacle. But she has she had a team of some sort or at least like a friend or has been doing it long enough that she should be able to jot down the, the 10 questions she knows she's going to be asked, right? This is what we do in media prep. We, we anticipate the questions, go through answers. It's something of this scale, we'd probably do a mock interview. How did she not, how was she not prepared to answer you are recently stepped down and no longer Trump 101. You have recently been a bit a big advocate of the election denier and, and January 6th comments. Where do you stand now? You would think, had this announcement not happened, she'd be bidding for some of these jobs, right? You'd think that she would right. start to walk towards that center. And so this is something where I did have frustration with her on that as well. I, I Obviously, we have some differing of opinions. And I will say that coming through this and listening to you a lot, I do understand from my perspective, it's really a, a Republican RNC chair and somebody who really it was involved in both, again, that election denying and January 6th. Because we do have Reince Priebus is a contributor, former RNC chair, Michael Steele, former RNC, RNC chair. He has his own show, I believe. So this is something that, that they have done before. Before we get completely off, I do want to just chat about the NBC side of things, because one thing Reince Priebus in a recent interview, he's on ABC, said that before his hiring, he went in, he did the conversations, he was with staff, he was with on, staff, on air talent, had conversations, answered questions, did interview off the record kind of stuff to see if this would work. And he was surprised that was not uh, the case, that it seemed a lot of the on air talent was surprised about this decision that it wasn't said. And then the NBC chair and his quote after letting her go said, no organization, particularly a newsroom, can succeed unless it's cohesive and aligned. Over the last few days, it's been clear that this appointment undermines that goal. So these are when these kind of things always happen, it just is always a, a little crazy to me. Obviously, NBC, like you mentioned, and these other news sources do need to find a way to appeal to Republicans. In this move, it seems like, despite the fact that Republican Party just fired Rana and now NBC fired and Republicans are, are upset. So it is a weird little thing. But where do these where does NBC go from here? Where is where to remedy this fact? And now they pissed off maybe even more Republicans that, that were already not paying attention. To. There's no question that there's going to need, need to be an outreach here. I just want to answer that. Uh, I'll answer that. But then I want to just offer one more thing. You made a great point about how when we're in roles that we, people need to sometimes toe the company line. Uh, let's talk about baseball for a second. It's you. There are broadcasters 
a baseball analyst who worked for baseball teams. So someone goes from work being a player for a baseball team and they come in and offer analysis. That's informed analysis. They've played the game. There's, I, I believe that some of the best kind of commentary and analysis that comes on game day, whether it's baseball or other sports, comes from those who have played the game because they're offering insight. The problem is, what would happen if a media outlet decided to bring in Pete Rose to call baseball games all the time, who has, been, who has a lifetime ban for baseball? Now, they're, that's an extreme example, but he has some barnacles on him based on his career in baseball and the fact that he's he's been banned from he wasn't that was banned for a long time from all major league events but he has a checkered past in the world of baseball and so having him come in and be a regular on-air commentator aside from the legal challenges and some of the restrictions that major league baseball would put on that people would i think recognize that he has a perspective he certainly has a perspective and knowledge of the game but having him on takes some time and there's been a slow transition where Pete Rose has come back into the universe of baseball. Now, that's an extreme example. I'm not saying that Ronda McDaniel did anything to the same degree of some of the, the issues that Pete Rose was accused of, but they are both, in essence, figures in their particular arenas, one in sports and one in politics, where they have some degree of some questions about some decisions they made in their roles in that. And so their transition um, and I think as someone who's you know read a lot about Pete Rose, I think one of the reasons his transition has been a bit slower in has been his willingness to admit and be contrite about what he fully did. I think Rana was far too speedy on that. And so I do think that that's, a, I think, an example that I would offer. I will say the danger is going to be that this is going to be a message that Republicans aren't welcomed, which, again, I started this premise by saying that media outlets need to do a better job of reaching out and tapping into conservative voices. And what that means is not conservative voices, not people who consider themselves Republicans like I do, who don't support Trump, but Republicans who passionately support Trump and believe in his candidacy in ways in which I never have and never will. That voice needs to be covered. I just think that Ronda McDaniel was the wrong pick. And so there's going to need to be some course corrections by the media outlets. But I just, in closing on this subject, want to say Ronda McDaniel is not the hill, I think, for conservatives to be dying on. Last question, though, uh, on that is how, who, I'm not saying you have to name a name right now, but is there a high level Republican messenger who supports Trump? that hasn't made a comment about the election or on January 6th would be able to even step into that role? It's, it's not, it's not. There are Republicans on broadcast television all the time who have doubts and criticisms about the 2020 election. She was, what was her role? She was in the, the, the she was at the <laughs> head of the RNC at that point. She had a much more active role as articulated very well by Congresswoman Cheney about her role in pressuring Michigan officials not to certify a le uh, legitimate election outcome. Ronna McDaniel has her hands dirty a bit. And again, I believe she's smart. She has a perspective and she should have a voice in media. I just believe in this particular instance, Becky, it was far too fast and there was not enough thought brought in. And I think your comparison to Aaron Dupree is a great way to explain it. And and I hadn't thought about it that way. But once you said, it, I'm like, okay, that makes that's a really good way to explain it. Because in the scenario that you're describing, that gives an example, I think, outside of the partisanship and that allows people to look into it. So it's a really good example that you offered. Thank you. And I enjoy doing these podcasts because I think like we talk about having these kind of conversations. And so when this was one that we had different angles and, and points of view, I obviously I enjoy having that time to have that conversation. And, and I learn a lot and I do see it from a different view. I, I think with my maybe personal internal guilt about some of this, and it, it was a little jaded and wanting to be a little bit more supportive of her, but I'm hopeful that we get Republicans in there and we get more reasonable, rational, vocal messengers to, to show what the Republican Party is about and stands for outside of simply January 6th. Absolutely. I learned a lot. Your perspective was good. Very good. And I, and it's helped moderate and temper some of my remarks. So I appreciate the discussion. 
moving on, a topic that is now apparently a weekly topic here, which is no surprise. I think we chatted that we expected this to be, is abortion. There was a recent poll Axios put out that conducted March 26th to 27th. You alerted me to this one that says more than seven in 10 Americans support access to abortion pills. Is that high to you? Is that number? What do you feel about this? Was this surprising for you to see the breakdown across party lines? It, my first reaction was to say that you called it. That's literally my first reaction when I read the head and like, oh, this is exactly what Becky's been saying. That was literally my first reaction. And so I think that uh, seven in tens, I, seven in 10 Americans support access to abortion pills. I think that is uh, a, a really just clear message about a subject as you articulated, we've discussed before. And I think in clear kind of realistic political terms, I think it's it's just a number that I think is it reinforces, I think, also a narrative that we've discussed and going back and talking about abortion in how much of how much passion there is by Americans across all political spectrums now that access to abortion pills is something that that they support. I think the Axios poll was pretty just a very clear message. Your take. Absolutely agree. I was a little surprised that Republicans did hit 51 percent. You can officially say majority. I think that is something I, I expected to be in the 40s if I was making a guess about this. But I think I have long believed that abortion is something that obviously as time goes on, I think as it's hard to say this without sounding morbid, but as like my generation and continues and, and younger generations of Republicans come up, I believe this is a generational issue. I believe that this is something that younger voters are, and not saying that there aren't older um, or Republican voters that do support abortion, but it is something that's so ingrained. And even some Democrats, 91% of Democrats support this. So there is, I believe, still probably that 9% chunk, I believe would argue to say is likely in the large or the older category of Democrat voters. So this is something that I do see we will continue to see trending. I fully support this. I think especially this isn't just access to abortion. This is access to the abortion pills. We've been hearing a lot about this. There will be Supreme Court ruling about this, I believe, this summer. And bravo. Good job, voters. What would you, let me put you really on the hot seat here. You get this poll. I guess I'd answer this too. But I'll start with you. Just you and I are in our roles as partisans. We're, we're wearing partisans hats. We're doing so. We get this poll. What would our message be to those for serving in a staff role to those higher up saying, OK, we need to look at this issue because this really validates something, a discussion that you've led a lot about just talking about this issue. This these numbers are not good for Republicans. Let me rephrase it. These numbers are not good for Republicans who want to continually message on this issue and represent the 49%. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. If well, you, if, go if, ahead. If we're going, let's just, if we're looking at Minnesota, even by congressional district or statewide, we need to get more people on our side. We are not winning elections. We have the Republicans. We have those 49% of Republicans that, that don't support abortion, right? We've got them. We need to talk to the 51% of Republicans that do and the 76% of independents. 76% of independents. Those are folks we've talked about so much that are, this is an issue that is can be a complete turn on and off for folks, right? So we need to find a way to message on abortion, to to talk to those 51% of people, Republicans and those in the independent voters who potentially could come to our side if we're not just saying ban it all, ban abortion, ban access to pills, go do away with IVF, all of that. We alienate a good portion of those percentages. And, and that's something that if I was working on a campaign right now, I would say we need to figure out a way. Let's look at Nikki Haley's debate comments on this. Let's find a way to talk to voters about abortion. Because again, you look at some of those younger independents or Republicans, this is something talking to my friends that are not Republican voters immediately. If, if this is something that they is an issue that they are willing to, 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 to die in the hill. And so we need to find a way to talk to them or it's just going to be continuing to lose. Yes. I, I think the, what you will hear a lot from pro-life people is that they say it's, it's, we just need to win them. The hearts and mind is over. We need to win them. We need to win people over on the hearts. We just need to convince people that this is the right thing to do. And poll after poll, I think, shows that 
people have made their mind up and um, where they are in this issue. And I think the messaging, I think it's a subject that I think I, I feel it was not a subject that it was not a subject that I expect to talk about as much as we have, but it keeps coming up. And I think our discussions help frame it up, I think, for others. And so I, I hope we continue to discuss about it when it's relevant and it's newsworthy in the discussion. But I think that this is still a problem for Republicans. I go back to our conversation that we had about Walls, where he just talked about that. I'm paraphrasing him, but old white men need to just start listening to women more on this issue. That is still the farther I get away from that message, the more I think it's just a pitch perfect message. And I, I just wonder if there's a space sometimes for in the Republican Party for to have that discussion, because I think the data is pretty clear. I think the polling data is pretty clear as to where voters are on this. And I don't think that Republicans, which is frustrating because I imagine in your roles, and certainly I know my roles, but I manage your roles, there was some poll-driven discussions discussed on polling and things. And so in many ways, I think Republicans are messaging to the minority rather than messaging to the majority at the same time they're losing elections. And I think sometimes what is often forgotten by folks who are pro-choice are some of the reasons that some of the pro-life people are pro-life. And it's not about their wanting to deny women access. It's about them believing that life begins at conception and that this is murdering a child, essentially, or murdering an infant or a, a, new, a fetus, right? So it, it it's a different way of looking at it that, it, again, I in a lot of my work, I've talked to a lot of these really incredible pro-life individuals who have really strong beliefs because of that. And, and so I do get that. But I think this is, again, where we Republicans need to take that messaging opportunity that let's go back and listen to our conversation with former gubernatorial candidate Scott Jensen, that we want it. None of my friends that are pro-choice, would you go up and be like, I hope I get to have an abortion one day? Yeah. They say, if, sort of, God forbid, something that were to happen, they want that opportunity or that access, that ability to be that option to be on the table. And I think that's where, again, the safe, legal and rare, we need to get back to that way of talking about it, that this is not what we're we're striving for or a goal, but we should find a way that if, if a white woman needs or wants that option, it is accessible to an extent. And so, yeah. Yes, I agree. And one one point I would say, if we have, I think we should discuss about more uh, in future episodes, but I would want to ask in some ways, talk about it from the electoral standpoint. I've yet to have someone explain to me with polling data in a strong way, in, in I think a credible way, how a statewide Republican can win being as pro-life as Republicans want to be. And so I think the challenge I always say on the issue of abortion is, okay, great to have that position. Explain to me how you win in an election when the polling data, I think, is so convincing on the other side. And so I, I think we've yet to see a credible example or a credible plan by someone who is passionately pro-life, how they can run in this state in particular and win an election on it. And I think that's the challenge. But I, I greatly appreciate our discussions on it and your willingness to engage in it and, and be as thoughtful as you are. And if anybody out there knows of any state where there is a statewide Republican or even maybe a congressional Republican that has won in a district that we don't necessarily think a pro-choice or not 100 percent pro-life of person would win, let us know. I might do some research on this and see if we can glean anything from anywhere. But moving on to our last topic of the day, state of the state. So last week, uh, Governor Walz had his state of the state address. He was down in Owatonna at a newly renovated high school. What was your overall feel of it? To me, it had a feel of he's running. Uh -huh. That's honestly. And what was interesting, and I, it's interesting, is because of the podcast, because of how we've discussed these things. I now approach listening to these. I'm listening to them more from the, the perspective of how can we discuss it? And you, we have framed up a number of these discussions about state of the unions and state of the state as quasi campaign speeches. And so when I listened to his speech and watched it, to me, it had very much of that feel. He was, there was some clips, some other kind of audio visual things in, in ways to present his kind of narrative of kind of accomplishments that he's had. 
And my first reaction, my first kind of thought during the speech, and then at the end was like, yeah, he's running. There's this speech is packaged in a way that is is presenting, I think, the case for Walls to be a national figure. Completely agree. You start with a backdrop. This is the school. He's a former teacher leaning into that. Highlighted the GFL wins, not surprising, free lunch. I'm at Walls, paid family leave. Talked about goals for this upcoming session, gun control, abortion protection, had a nice story that he shared criticizing Alabama, again, the IVF controversy that's going on there, that him and his wife, Gwen, used IVF for their children and and how it obviously hits really home, which anytime you can have a nice uh, personal narrative, it really helps humanize an individual like a governor. One aspect that I... I don't think there was any shock value to it. I think it was a pretty nice, even keeled, good, solid speech, right? I liked the building component he had. He talked about building roads and bridges and career pathways and schools and opportunities for our kids. And if that's, if I had to put a pin in something that I think would be a theme for Governor Walls on a national scale, building is what I would pick that I could see him trying to glom onto and bring that forward because you're building bridges, you're building the future, you're bravo. If someone is that has that much foresight, otherwise future candidates, building is something that I think would be a good campaign theme. You do think that it was more backward, it was back thinking than it wasn't his vision as much as it was a little bit of a little bit of Spiking the football end zone dancing, building of the narrative about previous successes, correct? Yeah, because it's an election year. He needs yeah. to, he is doing his role. This year is not about him. He's doing his role right now to help prop up the DFL legislators, try to maintain all the majorities. He's trying to do what he can do to get, you obviously know that every news outlet in the state is going to cover this. This is your opportunity to get articles, get stories, radio, audio, TV, everywhere, talking about what the Democrats did last session and what voters should have on the top of their mind. And so he played that role well. In an interesting development, Governor Walls is going to be speaking speaking in New Hampshire. It was announced that he will be speaking in New Hampshire. He's going to be attending the, the it will be the keynote speaker at an, an event in uh, New Hampshire. Of course, we know, Becky, that New Hampshire has no political significance at all in the nomination of a president. No, you can just listen to our wonderful breakdown episode on New Hampshire politics in the Granite State that Becky led. But him traveling to New Hampshire for an event is a a clear indication of something that we've discussed, which is Walls a national figure. And I think we go back to, we we may disagree on that, but clearly I think this speech, the event in New Hampshire, I think it's fair to say He's he may not be running, but he's certainly laying it down, laying down the steps to run for something and be considered in that field. Absolutely. He's trying to raise the name ID, build the relationships at some point if he is running, whether that's in four, eight, whatever years, man, he could run for the next 30 based on our current candidate's age. He certainly, he, he's going to need to call up people and say, can you host a fundraiser? Can you host an event? Can you meet me, introduce me to people? So every trip he was in Iowa on Super Ju- or on Iowa Caucus Day, he's been doing all of these different things. And yeah, he's certainly starting to try to build those relationships and that network. Absolutely. We'll see what happens. It's going to be an interesting year. I want to thank you very much for the discussion this week. This was just the two of us talking, no guests, and we really went round and round on some stuff. And I learned a lot. Let me start over. I learned a lot about your perspective on Ron and McDaniel and other subjects. I learned nothing from you about Ham. I learned nothing. I learned nothing from you about Ham. But on other subjects, it was a great discussion. I'm I'm really glad to, to do this week. No, it was great. We don't really have many shows without a guest. And so it was a nice change of pace here. And I learned that you are a bland eater. So I will keep my hot sauce and salt away from you. That's right. Thank you again. And we'll be back next week. Bye. We want to thank you for listening to The Breakdown with Broadcore and Becky. Before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or on the platform where you listen. You can leave a review or give us a shout out on our website or across all social media platforms at BB Breakpod. The Breakdown with Broadcore and Becky will return next week. Thank you again for listening.